Thank you, Kate and the team, for leading us in uh, worship today here on Resurrection Sunday. I wonder if you have a memorable victory that comes to mind from your own story. A memorable victory. Uh, Usually it's one of those times when we seem to have somehow defied or beaten the odds. We're outnumbered or we're far behind and there's this kind of victory moment that someone saw coming. You know, if you're used to victory and victory happens over and over again, usually it's not memorable. Usually it's the underdog moment, the time when you are far, far behind. Maybe it is that you're playing a game of, say, 500 with cards, for those who are familiar, and your opponent is on 480 and you are still on zero. And then you pull up your hand and you realize that you can do a, a single hand of open misere for victory and 500 points. For those who get that, you know the feeling of the comeback. You're like, no one saw that coming. I was willing to take it to the negative 500, but here I am on top. Maybe for you, your victory was kind of doing a bit of a Stephen Bradbury. I know that's an old reference, but it still references today, right? Just hanging around, waiting to see who might fall over, only to have everyone fall over and just come through with the victory at the last second. The fact that it's become part of our vernacular to do a Stephen Bradbury, right? is evidence of the way that a victory like that kind of resonates with us. We love the fact that that took place, and not just because we're Australian, right? We just love the fact that that actually happened. Maybe it was something a little bit deeper for you, the kind of victory that comes to mind. You know, there are significant things that we face. Maybe it was like overcoming an addiction or something like that. It was all consuming, and yet... When you look back, you say, actually, I'm victorious over that. That was so restrictive and so all-consuming, and yet look at where I am now. Maybe it was the victory of forgiving someone who deeply hurt you. And for a time, all the way through life, you're like, I'm never going to be able to forgive this person. I'm never going to be able to be free from what they have done for me. And yet you look at yourself now as someone who has been able to forgive that person. Now that is a special kind of victory. All of these events, 500 Bradbury's, overcoming addictions, engaging in that deep work of forgiveness. For all these moments, maybe it looked like it was over. The outcome was inevitable. And then suddenly everything changes. I think this is one of the reasons why the resurrection story that we find in the Bible is just so profound, and we've got to engage with it now. So if you have your Bible, feel free to turn with me to Luke 24. It's going to be on the screen as well. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them, clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed with their faces to the ground. And then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the Son of Man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. It's just a really bizarre little ending to that section. It's like this kind of mystery that's left. It's a beautiful mystery. It's one we all need to engage with at some point or another. But you have to admit, resurrection is a pretty impressive comeback, right? Jesus didn't just beat the odds. He broke the odds. And, um, and I want to draw a few really profound truths out of this passage a little later. But first, I want to address what likely isn't so much an elephant in this room, um, but at the same time is an elephant in some rooms that we will enter from time to time. 
Namely, the elephant in the room that people don't come back from the dead, right? Like that doesn't seem like something that happens very often. Certainly not after multiple days. And for some people, as we engage in particular spaces, this is the hurdle, right? It's just like, but Jesus, he, like people don't come back from the dead. It's a done deal, right? And I remember back when I was in Bible college, there was um, some liberal theology floating around about trying to dismiss anything of kind of miraculous significance in the Bible, including the resurrection. And, um, and while academia continues to offer a lot when it comes to treating the Bible well, and you guys know me well enough to know that I love engaging in that, some particular lines of thought essentially reduced the resurrection down to this kind of legendary material. And so what I want to do is, before I kind of get stuck into this passage, I want to provide a really, really quick 11-point outline for evidence of the resurrection. I do mean this really, really quick, right? I've done this before a couple of years ago, but it's just so much fun that I had to do it again. And if you don't catch the detail today, I simply ask you to take in the pure volume. So a quick outline of why the resurrection isn't legendary material from an academic perspective. So first of all, the Gospels are written within several decades of the events that they record, which is not enough time for significant legendary build-up to occur, right? Completely inconsistent with other legendary material. Number two, the Gospels were written in a hostile environment, which would hold in check the development of legendary growth. Number three, if legendary growth was to have emerged, we would expect to find it in the later written works, but not in the earlier, right? However, the earlier works are filled with just as much miraculous material as the later. Number four, the resurrection is testified by five independent sources who refer to numerous other sources, each with unique material. These are found in the Bible, the most historically scrutinized literary work in the history of the world. Number five, the location of Jesus' tomb was well known by all. So if Jesus had not risen from the dead, this could have been easily checked out by both motivated parties, the first party being Jesus' followers, who would suffer persecution for their faith, and secondly, the opponents of Jesus, who would want to falsify the Christian claim. Yet all parties agreed that the tomb was empty. Number six, the resurrection narratives lack the characteristics common to late legendary material, but common to eyewitness reports. Well-known people like Joseph of Arimathea are named. They're actually named. If you are going to fabricate an account, you don't create this kind of detail with people who can easily be cross-examined. It's just not how legendary material works. Number seven, the resurrection narratives contain counterproductive material. Legends lack this. The role of women in a first century context do nothing but damage the testimony of the authors. We found that in the text that we read today. They are named and they are listed, right? It does not help legendary material. Number eight, the conversion of Paul is unexplainable except on the basis that he himself gives, that he confronted the risen Lord. This was a man dead set against Christianity and then in one moment he was converted. Number nine, Paul himself gives us an early list of the resurrection appearances. This was written about 15 to 20 years after the resurrection, and he notes that more than 500 witnesses, most of whom are still living, he points to a living evidence of this reality. And the last two, without resurrection, there is no way of accounting for the transformation of the disciples. One day they are fearful and hiding. The next they are facing hostile audiences preaching the resurrection. And number 11, there is no motive for the disciples to fabricate the story. They had nothing to gain and everything to lose. There is nothing to suggest that they were disposed to or even capable of pulling off such an incredible fabrication, even if they had wanted to. So just a little quick thing on why the resurrection is not legendary material. And this is from an academic perspective, in case you're wondering. All these characteristics, right, completely condensed what we contest what we see in legendary material everywhere else. So it's pretty overwhelming. It's pretty overwhelming. If anything, people need to make a case against the resurrection. Now, is it definitive? Of course not. But is it compelling? Absolutely, right? But the power of the resurrection is not that the event can be historically deduced through logic. That's not the power of the resurrection. It is the truth and the hope 
that it declares over us for both today and into eternity. Let me just say that again. The power of the resurrection, what we celebrate here on Resurrection Sunday, is not that the event can be historically deduced from logic. Okay, I agree that it happened. Fine. That's not the power. The power is the truth and the hope that it declares over us, both for today and into eternity. And I want to unpack these truths today. Because as people who are living in a broken world, and I don't need to tell you that you are living in a broken world, you are witnesses to this broken world, whether it be locally or or, or nationally, right? We know that we are facing certain what feels like odds. We are facing certain what feel like inevitabilities. And unless there is a source of life, hope, and victory otherwise than our own strength, then that is simply the destination that we are headed toward. So I want to talk a little bit about truth. Note these words in Luke 24. On very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices. The stone had been rolled away, so they went in and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared. This puzzled nature speaks to something that is deep within all of us. There is this kind of idiom or this turn of phrase that is often attributed to Benjamin Franklin, but it actually precedes him. He made this statement, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes, right? This is what he said. Nothing can be said to be certain except for death and taxes and maybe Baptists not sitting in the front row, but we're full. (laughs) And while I don't have the authority to speak to taxes, the fear of death, that sense of the inevitability of death is something that all humans are subject to. And while each one of us would try to ward off the reality of death, this impending death, through all all these various ways, we try to distract ourselves through the accumulation of power or by possessing a whole bunch of stuff to make us feel secure or by getting people alongside through popularity. We do all these things to try and either dismiss or distract ourselves from the reality of death or to preserve ourselves from this death. The truth is, is that our self-preservation, our inclination to protect ourselves from death, which is, coincides with our sinful nature, there is this sense of inevitability from the world's perspective that death will have the final word. And so therefore, the way that people respond in the Bible should not surprise us. When the body of the Lord Jesus wasn't in there, they stood there puzzled. When these men spoke to these women and the women bowed with their faces to the ground and the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? The answer is kind of obvious. We didn't know he was going to be alive, right? Because he was dead. And isn't that the way that life ends? They remind them that Jesus had said that he was going to be betrayed and crucified and would rise again. And so they rush back to this group of men. And what we read there in verse 11, but the story sounded like nonsense to the men. It sounded like nonsense. Because coming back from the dead doesn't happen, right? It sounds crazy. It's not possible. That's not how things end. Even Peter jumping up and running to the tomb to look, peering in, seeing the empty empty linen wrappings, went home again, wondering what had happened. You see, the story of the resurrection seems so far-fetched, so ridiculous, and yet through resurrection, God was making a statement to the world. And it was this statement that death would no longer have the final word. We are inclined to believe that death will have the final word and we want to ward it off however we can and yet God, through the resurrection, was making a declaration, death will not have the final word. Apparently, death was not the powerhouse that we assumed that it was. 
And this is why there is such truth in the victory that is contained within the resurrection. Because resurrection is the antidote to our fear of death. Where we might be so inclined, and we are inclined, when we're at our worst or maybe when we're at our middle, to try and self-preserve, to look after ourselves, to succumb to that kind of sinful nature that is within us that says, oh, no, 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 death, I don't want that. We are reminded through the resurrection that we are invited to share in Christ's victory. Resurrection declares that life in Christ surpasses the inevitability of death. Christ is victorious, and we are called to share in his victory. Note these words in Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 to 15. For you were dead because of your sins and because your sinful nature was not yet cut away. That sinful nature is our inclination towards self-preservation, right? That was not yet cut away. It had not yet been removed. Then God made you alive with Christ, and he forgave all our sins. He cancelled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and the authorities. Now, these spiritual rulers and authorities are referring to uh, the powers of evil in the world. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. And so the writer of Colossians is really, really clear that resurrection changes everything, especially when it comes to our belief that death might have the final word. If we believe that death will have the final word, we want to self-preserve. There is a sinful nature that God wants to cut away from us. And yet through his resurrection, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities and paraded them through the street. He picks up on this imagery of a victorious king that they used to parade their enemies through the streets and the people used to watch and look at them. And these enemies that used to be this powerhouse and this threat were simply now just slaves. They were the defeated. They were the shamed. And this is what Jesus has done through the resurrection. He reveals the emptiness, the emptiness, the impotence of death for now and into eternity. This is the power of Christ and his victory through the resurrection. But this leads us to a second message that is declared over us through the resurrection, and that is one of hope. You note that when these women receive this message from these men, that he is not here, he is alive. We read in verse 8, then they remembered that Jesus had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell the 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. So suddenly from this place of being so puzzled, so confused, there is this hope that emerges once this declaration of resurrection has taken place. New possibilities suddenly emerge and they race to tell the apostles. You know, sometimes, and I'm sure you've experienced this too, but sometimes in my encounters with people, even Christians, I feel like there is this profound sense of hopelessness that some people carry. And it comes out in some of the phrases that are made. They will never change. I will never change. The world is falling apart and there's nothing that we can do about it. And you hear these phrases and maybe you've uttered them yourself from time to time and yet, and yet sometimes I feel like there's this profound sense of hopelessness that people are carrying around because again there is this feeling of there is an inevitable destination. Surely nothing good can emerge from this. And don't get me wrong, there are injustices there is oppression and, of course, this inclination that I spoke about towards self-preservation, right? That won't be dealt with until Christ returns again. But for Christians, trusting in the God of resurrection, we should see our world, our lives, and differently, right? 
We should actually see the world differently than everyone else because there is a deeper hope to hold on to that frees us from such despair. And this isn't some sort of empty optimism that's just like, oh, everything's going to be okay, you know. This is like trusting in the God who never wastes anything, right? It's like death will not have the final word. This is the God who can bring life out of the most dire circumstances. And notice how Paul describes this in Philippians, not just about the future, but about the present. He says in verse 10 of chapter 3, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. I don't mean to say that I've already achieved these things or that I've already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. And so there's a sense in which Paul, right, one of these people we hold up as like just the incredible apostle, the one who is sharing the good news in all these places. He's like, I want to experience the resurrection and not just in the future. I want to experience that power now. There's this deep recognition. It's like, I'm going to share in the sufferings. It's not like this removes the problems in the world. But as I engage in the sufferings of Christ, as I imitate Jesus, I get to also experience the God who brings life out of the most dire circumstances. I won't always get this. I've not yet achieved perfection, right? But I press on toward this reality. Paul wants to live in that perfection, that resurrection power, even while recognizing that suffering isn't going away. And so resurrection is experienced through hope. That's how it's actually experienced each and every day. It actually declares that nothing is beyond God's redemptive power. Like nothing is beyond God's redemptive power. If Jesus can defeat death, then nothing is beyond his redemptive power. There is no one too far. There is no relationship too broken. There is no circumstance too dire that God cannot bring hope and possibility through. This is a truth that resurrection declares. I wonder, I wonder if there is any part of your life, any area of your life that feels too broken, too difficult, too dead, too dead, right? That you have allowed despair to have the final word rather than God. Like is it, is there any part of your life that's it's just too hard, it's too broken, that you have decided this, like, no, no, that is beyond redemption. Resurrection says no. Resurrection declares that God won't waste anything, especially our pain. I love this photo. The first thing I need to make really clear is this is not photoshopped. Because it looks like it is, right? It's not. This is not photoshopped. This is one of my favorite photos. It was taken by Ronnie Bintang uh, in Indonesia. You see, the day after the eruption of Mount Sinabung, Ronnie, along with a journalist, drove to Maradingding village at the base of the mountain. Uh, Maradingding had been left empty. It was abandoned by its residents. That's understandable. And as he describes this, he says, volcanic ash covered everything, absolutely everything. As far as the eye could see, it looked like death. Stood in the village with this journalist taking photos, it just looked like death, grey, nothingness. And yet, For Ronnie, his attention was caught by a bold red hibiscus flower. You see, the volcanic ash had covered 
the flower while it was still in a bud. And yet in the middle of such death and destruction, it had bloomed to life. And so who wouldn't take a photo of that? See, what I share with you today is not an attempt to give you some empty hope, right? This isn't about just get back up on the horse, it's all going to be okay. This is about the declaration that resurrection on Resurrection Sunday makes. The death does not have the final word. Christ has disarmed the power of death both now and into eternity. And that resurrection power is expressed in those who believe through hope that in the midst of whatever is covered in ash that looks like death, that new life can bloom. This is God's promise. This changes everything. Resurrection changes everything. All the way back in Isaiah chapter 40, Verse 31, the prophet speaks. He says, those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. You see, even in a temporary world, covered in the ash of broken relationships, poverty, injustice, failure. Resurrection declares that death and despair will not have the final word. Resurrection is victory. Resurrection is hope. Resurrection is for today and into eternity. Resurrection is ours. And it changes everything about how we live. So my question, as we look at this image, and as I wrap up, my question is what, over what, do you need to declare resurrection? Over what in your life do you need to declare the power of the resurrection? where maybe you have become captive to self-preservation, to protecting yourself? Where does despair need to break through into hope, believing that God can bring beauty out of ashes? What ash-laden village do you need to bring to the living Jesus? As the messengers at the tomb declared, he isn't here. He is risen. He isn't here. He is risen. Let me pray. Jesus, we come into Resurrection Sunday and we ought to feel joy because you are alive. And yet, Jesus, I want to pray for those areas of our lives that feel covered in ash, that feel deserted. Maybe we've given up on them. Maybe we feel like your reach isn't that far. And yet, God, you proved the emptiness of death and the power of resurrection. You promise us that life has conquered death. You promise us that we can enter into that life now and into eternity. 
And so, Lord, I want to pray against fear. I want to pray against despair. I want to pray against all these things that we look around and see our broken world and we know run rampant. And, God, we want to be different. Through faith, we choose to be different. For you are the risen king. You meet us at our point of weakness and you allow life to bloom as proof of your life and your power. And so God, for each of us who right now carries something in our mind or in our heart that feels like death, I want to pray and speak in faith resurrection over that circumstance. Not that there wouldn't be suffering, for you suffered, God. But rather, God, that we would get a taste of that perfection that you created us for from the beginning. To trust in you as our creator God, who doesn't let anything go to waste, especially our pain. You are the resurrection and the life. The tomb is empty. In this we trust. Amen.